Hello everyone, my name is Stefan and I am a director at the Free and Open Source Silicon Foundation. This is the first episode of our new online event series called FOSSI Dialogue. Our inaugural presentation today will be by Tim Ansel of Google. He will present to you a joint project of Google, Skywater Technologies, eFabless and many others. It is an entirely open source PDK, the essential ingredient to free the last nanometer. The next episodes of the series will be around this PDK, covering all aspects and tools required to create a full open source ship design flow. In July, Mohamed Chalan will present open world support. In August, James Stein will present his work on standard cells, followed by Matt Goodhouse, who will present open RAM support. Finally, Tim Edwards will close this batch of presentations in the FOSSI dialogue series and present DRC shakes with magic. There are many more topics to follow. If you have any questions during Tim's presentation, please ask your questions in the comment section next to the video on YouTube. Please note that the comment section is moderated and your question may not show up immediately. We kindly ask you to stay on the topic of the presentation. After Tim pres Tim's presentation, we will ask him the questions as curated by our team. The recording of today's episode will be available on YouTube. So now I'm really curious to learn more about this open source PDK. How about you? Let's switch over to Tim. So, hi everyone. Hi Tim, how are you doing? Good, thanks. Excited to be presenting. And I'm excited to hear about your presentation. Thank you very much. Let's go. Well, hi everyone. Uh, this is my first remote presentation, uh, so it's going to be interesting. Um, I'm happy to be presenting today on a project that I've been working on for over a year. Um, but before we go into the project, um, I want to give you a little bit of background and context about myself to help you understand uh, where we're coming from and uh, why we are doing this. Um, so who am I? Um, this is what I look like when uh, not in the middle of 2020 uh, COVID-19 type crisis, um, a little bit less bushy normally. Um, and I kind of self-identify as a software engineer. And like most software engineer, I try and make all problems into software. Um, and I have a, uh, I'm also a strongly an open source uh, developer and almost all the software I develop is open source. Um, and I have a lot of projects. Um, I actually give a talk called uh, Tim has too many projects. Uh, you can see a previous edition on that link there. Um, and so you might already know me from some of my other projects that I've done, and they frequently have a hardware bent. Um, I worked on this project called the HDMI to USB, which was all about trying to build FPGA video capture hardware. And this comes back to being a software engineer. Uh, FPGAs effectively turn hardware problems into software problems. Um, I also do smaller projects, sometimes physically smaller. Uh, this is my Tomu project, um, which also has an FPGA variant, which is an FPGA dev board inside your USB port. And following on from that, because I'm an open source developer, I have been heavily working on 
improving the ecosystem in uh, the FPGA toolchain land through a project called Symbiflow. And um, all these projects that I've talked about have been hobby projects. And normally when I'm presenting, I would then present and say that, you know, this is not my employer's work. Um, and so many people don't actually know that for the last 12 years, I've actually been working at Google. I've had a whole bunch of different roles at Google. Um, but what I've found is that my personal and hobby projects have increasingly started to become related to the work I'm doing. And one of the things uh, that's interesting and happening to Google at the moment is Google is a website, but behind that website is a large number of computers, and my slides did not change then. Why did my slides not change? It appears we're having some technical difficulties. Um, what you should be seeing now is a slide showing uh, Google's data centers. And Google runs very heavily on computers. And this seems obvious, um, but it's something that people uh, take for granted that these computers are out there. And they look pretty cool, uh, especially when you turn off the lights. Um, but there's a problem that is happening at the moment. And this is what I'm working on at, uh, now at my day job at Google. People may have seen this plot before. It's basically a visual representation of Moore's law. You can see that transistor count is increasing, uh, but a lot of these uh, lines are no longer increasing at the exponential rate that they used to. Um, however, if you look at Google's products, um, we're, our demand for compute power continues to grow substantially, frequently at exponential type numbers. And this used to be a free ride with Moore's law giving us increasing compute power to keep up with um, this increasing demand for computation. Um, but that's kind of come to an end now, which isn't great. Um, and so we have a lot of projects at Google that are trying to solve this, and I'm working on one of them. Um, I don't work on uh, the most successful project we've had here, which is the TPU. Um, this is a ML accelerator uh, that has drastically increased our ability to do ML compute. Um, and this is kind of an interesting thing in it's showing that hardware that is domain specific can potentially keep up with this growing demand for compute. Um, the problem is it's taking a lot of effort to create these hardware accelerators. And while um, some groups at Google are big enough, like the ML people, to have dedicated teams working on dedicated hardware like the TPU, um, we are looking at the problem that every team at Google is eventually probably going to have to look at hardware accelerating their workloads, uh, especially if their demand continues to rise. And if we look at kind of what's happened in the ASIC design industry, we have seen that costs have spiraled upwards. And even with strong automation in ASIC design, there still has been a significant gap between the ideal uh, performance and the ideal transistor density that we should be getting on these modern nodes. And so thinking about this, 
um, the question comes is how do you make an ASIC? And so being a software engineer, I think about things in a certain way. And so this is kind of my first attempt and how I came initially to thinking about how you make an ASIC. Um, as I said, I'm a software engineer, so I thought about it in the software context. When we're doing software, we have our uh, code and then we pipe it into a compiler. Modern compilers are kind of split into front end and back end. The front end kind of passes the stuff and the back end converts it into something that a machine um, can process. And so if you look at like an C++ x86 uh, program, you'll see that, you know, you have C++ files, you run it through a compiler, out comes some assembly, which then convert gets converted to a binary, which you then run on your CPU. This is kind of how the we picture a software tool chain or somebody like me pictures a software tool chain. And if we look at the um, electronic design automation space and ecosystem, it looks like there are a lot of parallels here, right? You have your hardware design languages, which are equivalent to the code, things like VHDL, Verilog, and System Verilog. And then you have the high level passes, things like synthesis tools. And then you have the specific tooling, which takes the netlist and converts it into, in the FPGA case, a, a bitstream that runs on the FPGA. And in the ASIC case, should convert it into masks that you can turn into a integrated circuit. And as I mentioned, I've done a lot of FPGA stuff, and this is actually mostly true now. With open source tooling, um, we can take Verilog files, we can compile them with a synthesis tool, uh, we can do place and route in the FPGA, and then we get a binary we can load into an FPGA. And this is uh, the SymbiFlow toolchain. And so I was, when I got into this, I was thinking, you know, ASICs would be exactly the same, right? You take the Verilog code, you uh, run it through a synthesis tool, it goes into some ASIC tooling and out pops GDS at the end, and then you send it off to be manufactured. Um, and it turns out, however, that ASIC toolbox is actually surprisingly complicated. Um, it's significantly more complicated than FPGA tools. And this is, um, when I realized that this way of thinking about uh, ASICs wasn't really going to work. And so I then attempted to think about ASICs as a different method. Um, so ASICs really are made up of three parts. First is the design, the RTL design, this is your code. Then there are EDA tools. This is the stuff that takes your code and tries to convert it into um, the masks and the GDS that you use to create an ASIC. But there's also another part, which is the PDK data. And PDK data is what is needed by the EDA tools and sometimes even the RTL designer to successfully build a ASIC. The type of um, ASIC you design on a 130 nanometer node is very different from the uh, type of uh, system you might design on 22 nanometers. Um, and for those who don't know, PDK stands for Process Design Kit. Um, and it comes in, uh, a whole bunch of different varieties, and it's mostly tied to uh, the size of the transistor in the manufacturing process. So you'll frequently hear it called things like a 180 uh, nanometer node on TSMC or a 22 nanometer node on global foundries. Um, and really for you to have a open source ASIC, 
you're going to need these parts to be open. RTL design actually has a long history of being open. Um, there's the open cores uh, project that has been around for um, like longer and back before I was in university. Um, there was the open risk project, which was uh, basically risk five before uh, risk five was cool. And now we've seen this massive explosion in um, open source RTL design, thanks to uh, the new RISC-V um, architecture. Um, and you might have noticed uh, IBM has even started releasing open source RTL for their power processors. Um, so RTL design is very much covered in having a lot of open source history and being available. Um, but if you only have RTL design and not open source EDA tools, then you can't take your RTL design and compile it. And so um, EDA tools actually also have a fairly long history of being open source. Um, there's a site called Open Circuit Design, uh, designed by Tim Edwards, not to be confused with me. Uh, we're both named Tim, uh, but Tim Edwards actually knows what he's doing in the ASIC world. Um, I'm a software engineer pretending to be a hardware engineer. Um, there's also the Lyats and Coriolis flow um, out of, I believe, France. Um, and there's this new Open Road uh, project that is only a couple of years old, but also already getting impressive results. Um, and so these are completely open source tool chains. And so a company called eFabless uh, took some open source RTL and these open source tools and created a ASIC out of it called uh, Ravenna. Um, eFabless will come up multiple times in this uh, uh, talk. Um, and they were probably the first people to demonstrate uh, this combination existing and actually creating an ASIC from it that worked. The problem is uh, they used the XFAB 180 nanometer process node, and that has only a closed source process design kit, a closed source PDK. And so the PDK data wasn't open source. Uh, this is a problem because this PDK data is really important to being able to generate this ASIC. And so what you end up with is the PDK data infects your ASIC, meaning that you can't, for example, release the low level GDS for your ASIC. So eFabless did this really awesome thing of taking some RTL design and proving that you could compile it with open source tools, but they couldn't release the effective equivalent to the compiled binaries because the PDK uh, was effectively preventing them from doing that. And so what is in the PDK? Well, a PDK consists of kind of a grab bag of information. Um, the information uh, probably starts with things, what are called process design rules. Um, these are the things like how big your transistors can be, how many metal layers there are, all those type of uh, checks. Uh, if you're familiar with PCB design, um, then, uh, you would be fairly familiar with uh, the design rules you get for a PCB house, which is like how close the traces can be and the type of wires. That's very much similar in the ASIC world. Um, you then also get things like behavioral models and analog models, which give you a kind of description of how the thing will behave. Um, this is especially important in the analog space because uh, in the digital space, we tend to uh, think of things as ones and zeros in perfect harmony, um, whereas in analog, people actually understand that all their signals are partway between the two. 
Um, and then there's also a whole bunch of things called standard cells and parametric cells, which are kind of like the little building blocks that you use to build up a, um, a digital design. These are things like AND gates, flip-flops, and all that type of thing. Um, but at the scale that ASICs are working on, uh, transistors and um, a lot of these other uh, properties are no longer ideal. Um, and you get a lot of things like parasitic capacitance and resistance and a lot of this type of uh, issues. And so the PDK also includes a lot of information about that uh, behavior frequently extracted from real world uh, designs. Um, and there have been some attempts to create open source PDKs, um, but this was uh, a thought to be not something you could do. There's some older um, PDKs that you might be able to access that were on like um, uh, 500 nanometers and 350 nanometers. Um, there's a thing called the Free, D, free PDK, um, which was a non-commercial license. Um, there was the OSU libraries that uh, were released, uh, but only go down to 180 and are not particularly uh, dense at that space. And then like at 14 nanometers, there's the ASAP7, but again, it's very um, restrictive licensing. If you're an academic, you probably could get access to these, uh, but you're not going to get access to these under a license that is open source compatible, um, like uh, us open source people uh, would like. And so when I got into the ASICs um, uh, from FPGAs, I discovered this problem and I was lucky enough to work at a company that could help solve these problems. And so I'm glad to announce today that uh, we, in partner with Skywater Technologies, are releasing a open source PDK for 130 nanometer process node um, that Skywater manufactures. Um, this is a properly open source licensed. It's Apache 2, and it's available on GitHub. There's no NDI, NDA, there's nothing to sign. You should be able to just clone the repo. Um, it's almost all on GitHub. However, uh, some of the files uh, make GitHub a bit grumpy. And so uh, some of those files are instead hosted in submodules on the FOSS EDA tools, uh, uh, Google source Git hosting system. Um, there is one caveat uh, to contribute to this repo. You do have to sign a CLA with Google, uh, but that's not required to uh, use the PDK, fork it, um, any of these type of things. You're quite able to do just like any open source software um, out there. Um, we've also tried to make this PDK appear more like what a modern open source project would appear like. And that's having, for example, documentation hosted on read the docs. Um, if you're using Python, um, then you're probably very familiar with the Sphinx project. Um, we've been working on the Sphinx project to make it possible to use it to document a um, PDK. And we hope a lot of that will be reusable um, if other people are willing to also release PDKs. And we're hoping that this is just the first in um, PDKs that get released. And so this is kind of what the documentation looks like. Um, it's material design because, you know, we're Google. Um, but 
uh, it's still a work in progress and it will slowly be filled out over the next couple of uh, weeks. And you can see here's, for example, um, some periphery design rules documenting how various things uh, need to match. Um, I'm not an expert in this. Don't expect me to explain any of these design rules. Um, I am pretty much a software engineer. And so I can write software that uh, you know checks these. Um, it's much harder for me to tell you why we are checking these. Um, that's what we hope that uh, people like uh, Tim Edwards and other people who have done ASIC design are able to describe to us and we can automate uh, those type of checking. So what actually is the Skyward 130 uh, process node? Um, it's a process node that was originally uh, developed by um, Cypress and then spun out into the Skywater Foundry. Um, it has one level of local interconnect and five levels of metal. Um, it has a lot of support for um, things like inductors, resistors, and capacitors. Um, it has a high voltage mode, including up to five volt IO. Um, it supports uh, 10, uh, up to like 10 volts uh, for uh, voltage supply input, and it has a high voltage extended drain NMOS and PMOS transistors. Um, it's also a Sonos process, um, which means that it is particularly good for doing things like flash. Um, that's a lot of words. Um, I don't know necessarily what all those words mean. Again, I'm not an ASIC designer. I'm a software engineer, and I rely heavily on collaborators to um, uh, help me understand what's going on here. And so this is kind of what the uh, process node stack up looks like. Um, if you're a ASIC designer, apparently this diagram means a lot to you. Um, it doesn't mean a lot to me, but it is very pretty. Um, and I actually believe this might be auto-generated, but Tim Edwards would have to correct me there. Um, so the question I think you have is, what does the open source PDK include? Um, as of today, and um, when I say today, I mean probably in an hour or two, um, the digital standard cell libraries will be available. Um, the digital standard cell libraries are just the first step though. Uh, we would like to include a full set of IO and periphery cells, um, we will include the base set of primitives and um, full automated design rule check decks, a full set of analog RF primitives, and build spaces for SRAM and Flash. So this is going to eventually become a full PDK where you can do everything uh, from design analog circuits to designing your own standard cells to designing your own I.O. Um, but the initial release uh, is uh, just the digital standard cells. Um, and that would have been before this talk if uh, the git command I was running overnight uh, hadn't failed. Um, so it will probably be later today. Um, but uh, we actually have multiple sources for libraries. Um, there's the Foundry provided ones, which uh, come from the Skywater Foundry. Uh, then there's some work eFabulous has done. And we're also been collaborating with the Oklahoma State University, who you might notice from the previous slide around doing uh, open source standard cells. Um, and as I said, we're hoping to provide a quite comprehensive uh, list of libraries here as well. 
And most of this is um, blocked on my ability uh, to finish the uh, cleanup of these files. Um, and when I say just digital standard cells, what I actually mean is quite a large library of multiple um, different styles of digital standard cells. Um, the one we've been mostly playing with is the high density. There is also a low leakage version of the high density. Um, there's a high voltage library. Um, then there's a group of high speed, medium speed, and low speed cells. And there's also a cell concentrating on low power. Um, and these are pretty comprehensive cell libraries. Um, you're talking kind of 150-ish uh, different cells in each. Uh, the high voltage library is probably the smallest cell library. And they don't all have exactly the same cells in them. Um, this is just a subset of um, a uh, spreadsheet that I have which tracks which cells are available in which libraries. Um, for example, some of the flip-flops are available, uh, some flip-flop variants are available in all but the high-density, low-leakage uh, library. And uh, my current assumption is that is because uh, you can just use the high-density version there. Um, and some things like uh, level shifters are only available in the high voltage library. Um, and for example, in the low power library, there's a lot more um, cells around things like power gating and uh, bus drivers that say, um, uh, you know, uh, allow you to keep state when you lose power and things like that. And so here's an example of a GDS um, from one of the standard cell libraries. Here's the um, symbol and schematic uh, for one of the standard cells. I believe uh, this is a D flip flop with uh, both Q and not Q outputs and a scan chain. And this turns into a lot of files. Um, and these files kind of go on and on, but they kind of come in a whole bunch of uh, different formats. Uh, there'll be the full GDS. Um, there'll be LEF. There'll be Liberty Timing um, data, or more, uh, more correctly, there'll be timing data which can generate a Liberty timing file. Um, there are Verilog models uh, for digital simulation. There are also Verilog black boxes. Um, there's full uh, netlist transistor. Um, most of the sand cells come in multiple drive strengths and the libraries include important features like uh, glitchous clock muxes and buffers. Um, at the moment, all the files are released in um, uh, these base level formats. Um, we would like to enable them to work uh, with standards like open access, uh, but we need help to make that happen because um, the open access uh, file format doesn't have uh, open source libraries for reading and writing them, which makes it very hard for us to uh, create um, those versions automatically from the source data. Um, as I said, uh, on the primitives and the RF primitives, um, we plan to have uh, full parametric models for capacitors, inductors, and resistors, and full uh, SPICE simulation models. Um, a strong I.O. library that has been used in production uh, 
by multiple different uh, parts in the world with full ESD protection and a whole bunch of data around how to build your own ESD protection. And specialized build spaces. Um, SRAM bit cells will definitely be included, um, plus the DRC rules to use these SRAM bit cells. Um, to get the type of density of SRAM in an ASIC that you want, uh, they, uh, foundries effectively let you violate some of the normal rules that you would. Um, there will also be uh, Sonos flash bit cells and the exceptions there. And maybe even in the future, um, things like reram. Um, Sonar, uh, sorry, Skywater is a technology foundry that uh, specializes in building processes that are compatible with wide varieties of different technologies and enabling um, using unique technologies in their production flow. Um, this is why uh, they collaborate very heavily with DARPA because they're looking at ways to uh, make uh, older process technology more competitive. Um, however, these are build spaces. They're not full uh, macros that allow you to just plonk down an SRAM. So they need a compiler to turn into macros. Um, We've been working with OpenRAM for the SRAM, but we also need things like OpenROM and OpenFlash. Maybe that's built on top of OpenRAM, it's unclear. Um, and so with uh, this open source PDK um, and open source RTL and open source EDA tools, um, we should be able to have a fully open source ASIC and you should be able to publish that data on GitHub under a fully open source license. Um, so that's kind of what the PDK is, but there's questions on probably how do I use this? So I'm going to pause for a sec, um, and then I'm going to go into some more details about how this might be used. Um, so for digital design, uh, the current project that we have been working with is a project called uh, the Open Road Project, uh, which has um, been created out of this uh, DARPA ERI initiative, which stands for the Electronics Resurgence Initiative. It's run by Andrew um, at the UC San Diego. Um, and it has a pretty huge team. Uh, probably that team is so big, you can't even make out those faces. Um, and it's pretty impressive what they've done. Uh, they have a full, uh, fully open source digital flow um, that starts at logical synthesis and goes all the way to GDS um, generation and then doing uh, parasitic extraction and um, static timing analysis. Um, this is kind of what it looks like when um, you're placing routing uh, digital cells around macros. Um, it's a pretty, uh, pretty, pretty process. Here's a, uh, another example of um, uh, digital cells being placed around macros in a much more complicated uh, design. And while this is an academic-led project, um, Andrew is a professor at UC San Diego, um, they very much want to build a um, community of contributors outside of academia both industry and community, um, like hobbyists and makers, um, should be welcome to participate in here. this. Uh, the big problem, though, um, has been that they have access to closed source PDKs. Um, there has been no open source PDK that people can reasonably use. And so 
Um, now with the Skywater PDK, this enables community who doesn't have access to the closed source PDK uh, to more effectively contribute. Another really cool thing about the Open Road project uh, is if you remember back to my original way of thinking about how ASICs would work, uh, that you kind of give it some Verilog, it does a bunch of compile steps and you get a mask set out of it that you send off to be manufactured. This is actually a design goal of the Open Road project. They want no humans in the loop, uh, which means that uh, no human needs to be involved in the process to uh, take a design from RTL all the way to manufacturable GDS with no DRC errors. Um, this is a pretty amazing uh, project, um, and they are most of the way there. Um, for the last six months, they have been focusing on um, a, a technology node uh, that is way more advanced than Skywater. Uh, they've been focusing on Global Foundry's uh, 12 nanometers. Uh, this is a quite an advanced process, and uh, they're getting very good results on that. Um, however, they've also uh, been very much uh, focused on doing Global Foundry's 12 nanometers because uh, that's what their contract with DARPA mandates. Um, and so eFabulous and the American University in Cairo under uh, Mohammed Shalan has uh, basically created Open Lane, which is a open road which has been customized to work well with the Skywater PDK. And he'll actually be giving, I believe, the next talk um, in this talk series about how that process works in much more detail than I would. Um, and so that's pretty cool. Um, so that's digital design. What about analog design? Well, that's an open question. Um, analog design is generally considered a bit of a black art. Um, here's some analog designers discussing their latest uh, advances. Um, and while we have pretty good analog simulators, um, we still need a lot of work in building out uh, the analog design ecosystem in uh, the open source world um, to kind of uh, enable the analog design to be more automated and less of a black art. Um, we have been collaborating um, with a company called Blue Cheetah um, to enable the Berkeley Analog Generator uh, to target the Skywater uh, process node. Um, we funded them to uh, create the required primitives um, needed for BAG, and they have been demonstrating um, a Intel's AIB, AIB is an interconnect um, between chiplets um, that they built a generator for. Um, they have been demonstrating that working on uh, the Skywater process node. Um, the problem with uh, BAG is that it currently depends on um, some closed source components. Uh, these components, I believe, all have equivalent open source components. And so it's just a case of somebody needs to swap in the uh, open source versions instead. And because it's a Python-based um, uh, generator, um, it, this should be pretty easy to do. It's just nobody has had an incentive uh, to do that yet. Um, there's also another um, tool for analog generation called FASOC. And the way that works is it basically uh, 
makes you create a bunch of analog standard cells um, and then uses the digital place and route tools with a bunch of extra constraints to do things like layout, uh, temperature, um, sensors, and all this type of thing. Again, uh, FASOC uh, currently only uses uh, closed source tools. And so um, we've given the University of Michigan a small grant to prove that they can use uh, the equivalent open source tools uh, for instead. And they will hopefully be working on that over the next six months. Um, this isn't done yet. Um, I'm sure they would love help and beta testers as that comes up. Um, FASOC is definitely got a huge amount of expertise in um, uh, making the analog side work, um, but I'm sure they would love help with the software engineering side. Um, a lot of these projects, like the Open Road project um, and FASOC, could use a lot of help in building out things like CI systems and um, uh, pulling the parts together so they work in a coherent strategy together. Um, so a lot of this is software engineering, not hardware design. Um, when you're designing a SOC, there's also some specialized tools that you need. Um, as I mentioned previously, a memory generator is really important. And so um, these are the BitRAM, uh, the SRAM cells. These are the actual SRAM cells from Sky 130. And you can see that a single port SRAM is significantly smaller than a D flip-flop. And both of these store a single um, uh, bit of data. Um, Memory design, though, is more than just the bit cell. Uh, the bit cell was provided by Skywater, but the memory design isn't. And so we've been uh, funding the Open RAM project to build a memory compiler for the Sky 130 process um, using the bit cells. Um, Open RAM uh, works with the closed source tools if you have access to them but also works 100% without any closed source tools. And it's designed to uh, enable you to build custom memory um, that uh, in whatever form you want. Um, that project will also um, provide pre-compiled macros. Uh, there's currently one kilobyte dual port RAM block is being sent for tape out. Um, and we will see if that works. And um, Matt Goodhouse, the leader of the Open RAM project, uh, will be talking about how that's going and what you can do um, in the October dial-up talk out. Um, the other thing is we're very interested in enabling new innovation. And so we wanted to be sure that uh, the data we had from Skywater was enough to do things like design your own set of uh, standard cell libraries. And so um, the Oklahoma State University has a long history of uh, designing standard cells. And um, you may have noticed their name was listed back on the, um, uh, you know, previous attempts at doing open source cells. Um, but we funded them to create a new um, standard cell library for the Skywater process. Currently, it has 68 cells, but they're hoping to expand it to full 120. Um, it has multiple drive strengths. And uh, currently, it's designed around an 18 track um, layout, but they want to do both 15 and 12 track layouts. Um, I have no idea what that means. Um, I just know that it changes what you can do with those standard cells and can potentially change um, how your router can perform. 
Um, and so that's pretty cool. Um, here's some examples of the standard cells that they've been working on. Um, I can kind of understand what these pictures mean, but again, um, I hope that I never have to look at these and that the tooling just chooses the right ones for me. Uh, the OSU standard cells have full left views, they have full characterization, and they actually have an uh, automated make file based system for extraction and characterization. I believe at the moment for that, they need the closed source tools, even though um, the uh, output uh, is released as open source. I think to generate the output, um, uh, you need some of the closed source tools, but they're working hard to remove those dependencies. Um, here's an example of um, a ARM v4 core. Um, estimated to run at 370 megahertz, I believe, on Sky 130. Um, and James Stein, who leads that group, will be giving a talk in September about how he went about designing these OSU cells for Skywater. Um, we're hoping that uh, they can also take advantage of uh, the fairly unique feature of Skywater 130, which is the local interconnect. Um, I don't know if they currently do or not. Um, you'd have to ask James. Um, once you've built your design, you need to check that it works. Um, and so you need a DRC and LVS checking tool. And for that, um, we've been looking at a tool called Magic. Um, Magic is probably the only piece of open source software I've ever contributed to that is literally older than I am. Um, it was released in 1980. Um, that's uh, three years before I was born. Um, the latest release, I believe, was yesterday, um, where uh, Tim Edwards uh, pushed a, a few small fixes. So that's a pretty... Uh, epic um, history. And it does pretty comprehensive DRC checking for the Skywater 130. Um, it also does netlist extraction for LVDS and a lot of other things I don't understand. Um, and Tim Edwards will be talking about um, how that works. Um, Tim Edwards is the Tim who knows um, uh, stuff about this. Um, I just happen to be an enabler here. And so if you get to talk to one Tim, I would probably suggest Tim Edwards, not me. And so um, to kind of verify that uh, what we were releasing made sense, um, we again partnered with eFabless to do tape outs on this process. Um, and so they have developed a line of um, I test ICs called Strive. Um, it's a little Pico RV32 with 1K of memory and a little bit a little uh, spy controller and uh, all digital PLL and some GPIOs. So a very, very simple SOC. And uh, the first variant of that was done with uh, flop RAM, basically the SRAM for the whole um, system was generated using uh, D flip-flops, which obviously, as you saw previously, takes up a lot more space than you'd like. Uh, but this was fully laid out using OpenRoad, using the open source PDK, and has been sent by tape out. Um, the reason they use flop RAM is because open RAM wasn't successfully generating a macro at that time. Um, and so the moment open RAM uh, was working, they did a version which instead uses a one kilobyte block of open RAM SRAM as the main memory instead. Um, you can kind of see from the 
uh, distance between um, the pins on the outside edge. Um, you can kind of see the spacing is much more tighter. Uh, this is a significantly smaller uh, IC. Um, but they haven't stopped there. Um, they are doing a version of Strive, which uses the OSU um, cells. Um, they are doing a version of Strive, which has eight kilobytes of um, SRAM by uh, building an array out of the one kilobyte open RAM blocks. And they're doing another version of Strive, um, which has uh, designed for test features automatically injected using an open source tool. Um, and so Strive really is um, one of the first uh, fully open source ASICs that have FOSS RTL, that use FOSS tools, and use a FOSS PDK. And these will be pushed public sometime soon um, by eFabulous. Um, complain to eFabulous, they're not public, not me. Um, they're doing the work here. I just signed the paychecks. Um, and this is pretty cool because they will be able to publish GDS for these parts. I would not recommend you tape out Strive yourself. These are just test chips. Um, but in the future, there will probably be a production version of Strive that you can use. Um, Muhammad Kassan, who is uh, different from Muhammad Shalan, uh, will be uh, talking about the Strive SOC family and some of the learnings from the Ravana project that they've done previously in August. And now, um, this is probably the biggest announcement. Um, if you have a open source PDK and an open source, um, you know, RTL and open source tools, you probably want to do something with it. Um, and firstly, I want to say uh, 2020 so far has been pretty crazy. And so uh, these plans um, are subject to change. But currently, what we want to do and what we're planning to do is in collaboration with eFabless, we are doing an open source shuttle program. Um, if you've done or participated in shuttle programs before, uh, this is not your average shuttle program. Um, the philosophy we've taken here is somewhat different to a normal shuttle program. Um, the kind of philosophy we want is that your prototypes shouldn't be uniquely precious. You should uh, think of them as throwaway items that you have enough from that you can share with other people. If you have done a test shape out and you get a set of chips back, you should have enough chips that if somebody who's doing research in the same area wants one, you can give them without give them one without even thinking about it. Um, and we want this to enable more reproducibility, more verification, more comparison of what people are doing. We would also like to see people fail. And this is not something you normally see with ASICs. ASICs are all about getting silicon right the first time without any issues. We want to see people trying new innovative things that they haven't tried before. And when you're doing that, and when you're pushing the boundary, there are going to be experiments that don't work. That is the fact of trying new things. And so it should be OK to fail and OK to try again if you're learning from the experience. And so the first 
shuttle launch will be on sometime in November 2020. There will be a second early in 2021, probably six months after um, the first shuttle run. And then we're hoping to do a uh, program where we run a shuttle every three months after that. So I think uh, the first question you probably have is, am I eligible to be on the shuttle? And the answer probably is yes, as long as you're willing for your designs to be open source. Um, this is why it's an open source shuttle. Um, it's open to anyone, academics, makers, hobbyists, commercial companies, startups, um, but you must be willing to publish your complete design down to the GDS under an open source license. Um, you need to include the full source. You can't just include the GDS. Um, and there'll be roughly 40 slots per shuttle run. Um, if we get more than 40 designs in a shuttle, then um, we will figure out a criteria for how to select them. Um, it may be as simple as a lottery. Um, we will see what happens. Um, but to be included, what you'll need to do is submit to eFabless a public Git repository URL. Once you've done that, um, an automated system will do a whole bunch of verification checks on your design. And if it's accepted into the program, you'll be emailed. Or if it's eligible to be accepted in the program, um, you'll be emailed. Um, so this is very much a case of the work here should be public and it should be under open source license because we want people to take what other people have done and build on top of it. We want a collaborative environment that gets better every time we do a shuttle. So what is a design? Um, you will get roughly 10 millimeters squared for your own design. Um, the actual um, uh, design size is 16 millimeters, I believe. Um, and every design will include a standardized harness with a RISC V, um, some power circuitry, and RAM. Um, this will be isolated from uh, the area that uh, your um, uh, design goes into, but will enable basically um, probing and controlling the uh, your region if you want. Uh, this enables us to basically also get 40 uh, different uh, ways of testing uh, RAM, RISC-V, and power. Um, from the shuttle, you will get back order 100. It could be as little as 100. It might be as high as 400 um, packaged ICs. Um, these ICs will probably be packaged in a wafer chip scale package um, with about 40-ish IO. Um, the idea is that these should be usable by you um, just like any other IC you get back. Um, this does mean we need to standardize the IO. Um, the standardized harness gives you a way to do interesting things like IO muxing um, and know it's going to work um, because you know that the uh, processor can provide that functionality. Um, and so this is kind of, again, a different 
thinking of how to do shuttles. Um, we're hoping, and this might not happen in the first harness, um, but uh, you know, in the second harness and third harness, um, it's likely there will be inbuilt analog to digital and digital analog converters, which let you do um, uh, effectively internal sensing of your system. Um, you can put whatever you want in that 10 uh, millimeter squared. You can put multiple projects there if you want. Um, 10 millimeter squared is way more than enough to do like a four or eight core multiprocessor risk five um, is probably not going to be a Linux capable one, but uh, probably a microcontroller level one. You could do an ML accelerator. You could do analog design. Um, we will have a number of IO pads where you can replace them with your own analog drivers. Um, so if you're interested in this, you should go and join the Skywater PDK announce list and an email will go out when uh, the full details are available. Um, and that is an exciting program. Um, I get evaluated basically on um, uh, how successful this is in an ecosystem sense. I'm more interested in people trying new things and building on top of other people than doing just another risk five. Um, and so I would like to see a huge amount of new innovation. And I'd also like to see people innovating by changing their design, the tools and the PDK at the same time. This is something that hasn't been possible before because all the, uh, like one part or the other has been closed source. Now you have all the three parts open, um, you can modify them all in tandem. And if that gives you a better result, then uh, great, do that. And so um, lastly, as I mentioned, there are future talks. Um, the first talk will be from Mohammed Chalan about doing digital design uh, using Open Lane, which is a customization of Open Road. Um, it heavily uses Open Road. Um, it shouldn't be really figured, uh, thought of as a uh, separate project, as more kind of like a skin on top of Open Road. Um, the Strive Sop family from Mohammed Kassan um, from eFabless uh, will be August. Uh, James Stein will be talking about uh, designing new standard cells in September. Uh, Matt Goodhouse will be talking about Open RAM in October. And then um, Tim Edwards will be talking about DRC checking in November. And now I think it's on to questions. Um, I think I've run a little bit over time, um, but uh, we had a lot to cover and we did start a bit late. Um, so, um, I'm happy to take questions for about 20 minutes until 10.30 my time. Yeah, thank you very much, Tim. Um, very exciting news. Um, we got a lot of questions. Um, so there was one correction um, on the slide. So people that didn't listen to the sound at this time, um, there was a mistake July, not June was written. So the standard digital cells are available today, right? Um, yes. Exactly. Okay. On a slide. Sorry, down. I get July and June confused. <laughs> um, uh, yes, they should be. They should have been available now. Uh, but a command that I ran last night and wasn't paying attention to failed halfway through. So I need to rerun that command, and then the um, standard cells should be available. <laughs> um, uh, so. Definitely before I go to bed today, the digital standard cells will be up on the Skywater PDK repo. Awesome. That's great news. Then we have one important question. How much do the shuttle run cost? Um, so uh, to be involved in the open source shuttle, um, it's 100% free to uh, the people who get uh, 
included in it. Um, there's no cost to you um, to be uh, involved with that. Um, my group at Google is providing the funding to uh, eFabulous to make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to do your own private um, runs with Skywater, um, feel free to reach out to them um, asking what the price is. Um, 130 nanometers is a very um, uh, cost-effective node to do design on. Um, eFabulous will also probably be running its own shuttle program where your designs don't have to be open source. Mm -hmm. um, they're still trying to figure out exactly um, how that's going to work. Um, eFabulous specialize in kind of straddling that boundary between uh, fully open source and closed source um, because it's still going to be a long time before we get uh, a fully open source PDK for like Global Foundry's 12 nanometers. <laughs> um, and so um, eFabulous is trying to enable people to get access to technologies like that um, while still, uh, you know, um, uh, keeping the foundries happy. Hopefully more and more stuff um, will be fully open. Um, but I don't think uh, there isn't a space for closed source IP, closed source tools, or um, closed source PDKs. Um, just like there is open source software and closed source software. And in fact, I still use closed source software in my daily um, uh you know, thing I used what is the best tool for the job. Um, and uh, the idea here is to enable people who previously wouldn't have had access to. Um, we definitely want to support things like the cadences and the mentors and the synopsises of the world um, in uh, working with open source RTL and open source PDKs. Um, they definitely have a unique approach to um, doing this. Um, and so um, we would love to support them. Um, however, my access to those tools is limited um, and my time is limited. Um, and so uh, we will need help from the community who has access to those tools to uh, enable support for that. Um, I'm also uh, not an ASIC designer, and a lot of these tools are very much um, require specialized knowledge to operate. And so um, I don't know how to work them, even if um, even when I do have access to them. So from your point of view, is it possible to design a full ASIC and ship the GDS to the FAB with all open source tools? Um, yes. It's very, very close. Um, the IO cells would probably be the biggest missing piece, like as this very moment. Um, once the IO cells are released, then um, uh, you have everything you need. I mean, technically, you could probably design the IO cells yourself at the moment. Um, maybe not. Uh, maybe the primitives need to be uh, more available. Um, Again, I'm not an ASIC designer. Um, I don't know if there are roadblocks that I haven't seen yet. Mm -hmm. um, the definitely, uh, we have kind of existence proof that Strive um, doesn't use any uh, closed source RTL. It doesn't use any uh, closed source cells. Um, it doesn't use any closed source tools. Um, the design was checked with magic. Um, it was also checked with uh, Mentor Caliber, and uh, they both agreed on um, that it was clean. Um, and so um, I believe today, um, once uh, these examples are published, it's very possible. Um, there are pieces missing that um, you you probably want on a standard Internet of Things chip. For example, um, there are no voltage regulators. Um, for Strive, you have to provide uh, 
basically the voltage supply externally, which means you have to provide both like a 3.3 volt IO and a 1.8 volt core. And mm -hmm. um, there's no PLLs, there's no A to D, there's no D to A. Um, we're hoping that uh, things like Blue Cheetah and uh, like Blue Cheetah's bag and um, FA SOC enable us to uh, create a lot of uh, those that IP um, uh, you know create that IP uh, more quickly um, but we're also hoping that analog designers um, who uh, I have been told actually quite like 130 nanometers um, it's apparently quite a nice uh, process node for doing analog design will also create these designs and release them as open source. Um, when the primitives are available, that is most certainly uh, doable. Um, that getting the primitives out is highly uh, high priority on my list. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we definitely want to do that as soon as possible. And um, I hope to be able to do it in less than a month. Um, we're not talking six months, we're talking weeks to maybe months at the longest to get that full set of stuff out. Um, the other big thing was, um, you know, there's no flash compiler yet. Mm -hmm. um, there's none of the periphery needed for doing flash, like the charge pump and all that type of thing. Um, for SRAM, there's OpenRAM, and that's working. Um, OpenRAM still needs a bunch of work to support, for example, single port RAM and not needing the straps and stuff like that. Um, Matt is working on that, um, and I'm sure he would love help. Hmm. Uh, a lot of that is mostly Python coding, not um, analog design. Yeah, I see. And OpenRAM uh, generates all the, you know, uh, non-standard cell parts of the memory compiler, like the sense amp and the drives and the layout and all that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so the fact that those don't exist in the build space is perfectly fine because OpenRAM can do that work. OK, awesome. Um, and that's a question um, probably regarding um, the, the production, if you want to run outside the shuttle. Um, if there's any limitation on the by the foundry on the accepted DRC or LVS tools, um, so the foundry does use Mentor Caliber for the final DRC check. Mm -hmm. um, Any time uh, Caliber reports an issue that the magic doesn't, uh, we consider that a bug. That should be fixed. In um, Caliber or in. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you'd be surprised which way, um, but mostly it's been in Magic. Uh, Tim Edwards has added a whole bunch of new functionality to Magic to support uh, some of the more interesting design rules. Um, I would love to see K layout support happen as well. Mm -hmm. um, that's not, we don't hate K layout. K layout is pretty awesome. Um, I just don't have the bandwidth to do everything at once. And I'm pretty sure um, uh, that I've been in contact with um, one of the K layout uh, developers. And he has said uh, once the magic uh, rule sets are available, he will most certainly do a K, K layout variant. And when he does that, um, we will be ensure to include it in the PDK so that everybody gets access to it. Awesome, yeah, thank you. Um, there was a question regarding the, um, the different cell types. Um, so the question is, do the low speed and medium speed cells have some advantage that would cause you to use them? Um, yes, uh, they use less power. Um, and so um, the theory is you want to use the high speed stuff on your critical path and then use uh, the low speed stuff everywhere else. Um, and in theory, um, you know, the medium speed, which kind of straddles the boundary. Mm -hmm. um, I have no idea if this is works or not and how you do that. Um, uh, 
I just know these cells exist. We may find that, for example, the high density cells are just are always a better choice than, um, you know, the speed based cells. Um, this is something I would like people to explore. Um, for example, in 10 millimeters squared, it's perfectly reasonable to potentially tape out um, four risk five microcontrollers using the different sets of cells and comparing their performance. Mm -hmm. And then you can use the supervisor risk five to effectively switch the IO between different internal risk fives. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's just two questions regarding licensing and copyright, which I will just quickly touch because they're a little bit um, just touching um, the questions around the shuttle run. Um, so is there any restriction on the licenses acceptable for the open source shuttle run? So is it like OC um, approved licenses or is it any license in particular? Is, like, is there any restriction on copy left because um, of something outside the uh, scope? <laughs> uh, no. Um... The harness design will be fully open source and available under um, probably an Apache 2 license. Um, and Apache 2 and uh, GPL is compatible with each other. Um, so uh, that should be fine. Um, we will publish a list of acceptable um, licenses um, in the near future. Um, if you stick to your... Uh, um, Apache 2, GPL, uh, solder pad, CERN licenses, um, you're probably going to be fine. Um, if you don't know what you're doing, just select Apache 2. Um, that is a strong preference um, uh, because of um, some of the what does linking mean in hardware is an issue for GPL. Um, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, go and talk to your lawyer about um, licensing. Um, go and talk to opensource.org about licensing. Go and talk to the Open Hardware Association about licensing and how those things work. Okay. Um, generally, do not take legal advice from engineers. <laughs> uh, take legal advice from people who are full-time lawyers and... Um, Engineers get this stuff wrong all the time. And, you know, um, everything I do is, you know, informed by working with lawyers about how to do these things. Okay. And just a quick thing. Um, is there any copyright assignment needed or is it just open source? Uh, no, okay. not for um, the shuttles. Mm -hmm. uh, for the um, contributing directly to the PDK, ah. there is. Yeah. Um, but not for the shuttles. Uh, you don't have to assign copyright. You retain full copyright to the um, uh, thing that you're submitting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you're just release in the process of submitting. Uh, the thing needs to be already publicly released under a open source license. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah. One question is: Is it possible to design your own cells? And use them in the in a shuttle, for example. I think, or um... Um, there, as I said, there'll be a couple of I/O cells that um, you will be able to replace. Um, most of those will be uh, most of the I/O cells, though, will be a specific set, um, and this is because of uh, the um, we want to effectively. Uh, have a standard I.O. layout mm -hmm. and a standard package um, so that we can effectively package all the chips up and get them out to you uh, quickly so that you can have a IC that you can actually use without having to have access to things like wire bonders or contracts with, um, you know, packaging houses. Mm -hmm. um, this does mean you're not going to get... Um, to get to do a custom pad ring and all those type of stuff um, because, you know, um, this is a fairly a large, complicated project. Standardization is important. Um, and, uh, you know, there are things you aren't going to be able to do here. Um, so um, if, 
you wanted to do something that isn't possible, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, there will be other ways to do um, shuttles with Skywater. Um, yeah, if push comes to shove, you can go and buy your own shuttle at Skywater. <laughs> um, I'm sure they would love to have your business. Um, and, you know, eFabulous will be offering other alternatives um, that uh, cost money. Um, uh, so, you know, um, the reason eFabulous is offering this one for free at the moment is because um, we're funding it. Um, there is actually real costs involved. Um, and so, um, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, so as we're running a bit out of time, um, we have two, like, groups of questions. One is on timelines. Um, yep. There are like a couple of questions of timelines. Um, the one is around um, on the release of basic analog parameterized uh, cell libraries. Yep. Can you can you maybe say something? And the timeline for the open RAM is also a question that was asked. Um, so the open RAM should be um, days, hopefully. Um, the um, Primitives should be like O weeks. Um, everything I'm listed here, um, I give you permission to start uh, complaining to me <laughs> if they're not all available in two months, like eight weeks from now. Um, I'm hoping to have everything out in four weeks. Um, but uh, for example, the IO cells are reasonably complicated and so need a lot more processing to um, make available um, the primitives. Um, there is uh, complexity around uh, how do you define the parametric cells in a way that um, people can use, yeah. um, especially if you don't have access to commercial tools. Um, and so we're working with eFabulous and at Micro and Skywater to figure out how to make that possible. Um, there's also a whole bunch of documentation that will slowly go up um, uh, over the next couple of weeks as well. Um, there's a GitHub, um, uh, there's an issue tracker. Um, you should be able to find there a list of things that um, we already plan to do. Um, if there's pieces that are missing, um, then, or like a feature that you'd like to request that doesn't um, exist, uh, feel free to close, um, uh, sorry, open <laughs> an issue um, on the issue tracker. Um, please don't open uh, issues on the issue tracker about the shuttle program. Uh, that's not the correct place to ask about the shuttle program. No. Um, the Skywater PDK users list um, will be the correct place to ask uh, questions there um, uh, once it's announced. Um, as I said, uh, 2020 has been a bit of a crazy year. And so um, uh, our plans and what actually happens may, uh, you know, be somewhat different. Um, and so consider these kind of our aspirational plans and what we will try our best to deliver on, um, given what we currently know about how things are um, happening. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, there's one last question that I just want to reformulate probably because the, it's rather generic. <laughs> the question is, is there somewhere I can help out? Um, so what is the best point of contact if you are like, for example, a software developer fluent in Python or something where you should just drop in and ask, hi guys, awesome work. What can I do? Um, that's a good question and I probably should have a good answer for it. <laughs> um, there are lots of different ways to help though. Um, one of the big things is helping um, automation and improving things like um, uh, the documentation generation and uh, that type of stuff. Um, uh, there's also like, pardon me, continuous integration is an ongoing problem here. Um, 
a lot of the things like uh, place and route for an ASIC take, you know, 12 hours mm -hmm. and hence the standard um, way of doing CI on Traverse is not a going to work in these use cases. Um, they frequently require lots of resources and that type of stuff. Um, so uh, definitely uh, need lots of help there. Um, we also need lots of help in automatically evaluating whether things improve or regress functionality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, and, you know, um, running every design we can find through the open road tools using the Skywater PDK and looking at what the area is and, you know, whether it completes with no DRC errors at the end. Um, that is a mammoth problem to solve, and um, I don't think anyone's close to solving it yet. Um, mm, yeah. So I'd really like to see people tackling that. And that's not a hardware problem. That is a software problem of how do you distribute a bunch of things to workers and get the results back and build a database of yeah. you know the data and then present it in a graphically pleasant way. Um, you know, yeah. um, things like magic could really use a UI rewrite, maybe. Um, it's UI definitely looks like it's older than me. Um, <laughs> and a few things like that. Um, you know, K Layout, I'm sure, would love um, more developers helping them out. Um, you know, a lot of the um, tools uh, have. Uh, algorithms in them that could be improved by things like profiling and understanding where the performance is going on. Um, and, you know, just helping with code quality as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of the code has been written by hardware engineers and by, um, you know, students. And so um, uh, that could definitely use some help in uh you know growing um making the code more mature and these type of things um awesome, i think you have a great so, journey ahead here right it sounds like a lot of work but it sounds like a very great thing thanks a lot um so uh, i i just skipped over the other questions and i'm pretty sure they will be answered in the follow-up uh, dial-up sessions so there will be five more from now um i'm also pretty sure that we will give regular updates on the generic project progressing and probably questions like the timeline will, can be answered then again. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I would highly recommend people uh, sign up for uh, the Fossey Foundation. Um, what's the name of the? The El Correo Libre. Libre. Yes. So everyone should head um, to our website, fossifoundation.org or fossi.foundation. Um, you can find it there. Um, yeah, I think. Thanks a lot. I think I'm it's a great sure, summary. Um, follow announce announcements will end up in uh, that uh, yeah. newsletter. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, Tim. Really, it was a really great presentation. I think everyone was really thrilled about it. Um, thanks again for taking your time. Thanks everyone for listening. Um, yeah, since you're already on YouTube, how about um, subscribing to the Fossey Foundation channel to get regular updates? Um, it will be really interesting to see the next presentation, I think, a lot more on the individual aspects of it. And I really look forward to holding the first chip in my hand. Um, I, I hope in some connection I can get one. Um, yeah, for more, just go to our website. There's a special website, dialup.fossi.foundation. And yeah, thanks a lot, Tim. Any closing words? Yep. <laughs> I'm looking forward to um, watching the follow on talks so that I can actually understand a lot more about some of the things <laughs> I'm talking about. Um, I'm actually really excited to see um, uh, Muhammad's talk because um, I've seen the results of Open Road and uh, I've seen spreadsheets of data, uh, but I don't necessarily know the full details of about how it works <laughs> awesome. or. Um, what's going on there or how the stuff I'm working on relates to that as well. So, um, <laughs> and I'm also very interested to learn how you design standard cells um, from James and same with um, memory. Um, you know, 
I think all this stuff is super fascinating. Um, and the fact that you'll be able to take what you learn in these talks and go and replicate them um, yeah. with the exact tools they were using and then try them is um, really cool. And so um, that's super exciting to me. Um, I'm actually looking forward to um, hearing more about some of the stuff that I've worked with people on and um, helped get funding for. Awesome. So I hope everyone joins Tim uh, during the next presentations. Um, the next one will be um, in one month from now. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Have a great evening. Have a good night, wherever you are. And speak to you soon. Bye. Thank you.